I'm really excited to have my next guest on the podcast. He's the president and CEO at Eco Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin Nelson. Oh, thank you very much. I'm uh, excited to be chatting with you today. Likewise, likewise. Well, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Let's just jump right into it. Um, can you perhaps let the listeners know who you are and uh, what you do? Yeah, so I'm uh, the president and CEO of Eco Canada. Eco Canada is an environmental careers organization, and we're dedicated to support the environmental sector from an HR point of view. Awesome. And I always love asking my guests on the podcast how they got to their current role. And do some research on you. I see that you spent some time in the Norwegian Armed Forces, which is really neat. Um, perhaps you could give us a brief overview of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, no, I've had a, an interesting career journey. I started my career in leadership in the Nor Norwegian Army. Uh, as a Norwegian national, I'm uh, required to do military service. And I realized that I didn't want to do just a basic um, required service. So I applied to see if I could take one year military academy and count that as my um, my military service, which they accepted on the condition that I serve one year as an officer. So that was a great experience early on as a 21 year old to get my first leadership exposure, leading a group of 10 men who are older than me, more experienced than me, and a little bit um, hostile in the fact that I was there getting paid. They were there as volunteers that are conscripted. Uh, so that was a great way to be thrown into leadership at a young age. Absolutely. Um, so we talk about Eco Canada. What's maybe something that Eco Canada does that maybe most people don't know about or aren't too familiar? So we help build a strong environmental workforce. So our main objective is to ensure that there is an adequate supply of really competent people to meet the current and future needs for environmental expertise. If we want to sort of succeed in tackling some of the big environmental challenges that our that our, that our country is taking on need to have competent people. And that's really the, the, the intersect that we play in supply demand, making sure that there's enough good people for our employers to utilize. Yeah, I, I've actually read that there's a, a big move towards more sustainable ESG focused work. And what advice would you give somebody wanting to pursue a career in the environmental workforce? I think it, the environmental workforce is quite technical. So make sure that you have the technical background, whether from a uh, post-secondary institutions or any other training academies, make sure you do have the, the base level of technical experience in, in sciences or engineering. After that, um, in order to succeed in the career, you need to focus primarily on more of the softer skills or, or enabling competencies. Some of the big gaps that we discover when interviewing employers in the sector is that they're all saying that they don't have an issue with the, with the technical competencies of the people they hire. But they need people who are a little bit more financially um, strong, uh, understanding how to work on, on billable hours, understand how to uh, present their, their, their findings in a succinct manner, uh, business calls, business deals, business acumen, all very important aspects to focus on to, to succeed and grow in an environmental career. Mm. Speaking of skills, uh, kind of shifting the focus back on you, what's maybe a unique skill that you have that's made you become successful? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think uh, probably the greatest skill I have is the ability to recognize what I'm not good at. So I know what I'm good at, and I'm not. And I know what I'm not good at, and uh, and my success has come from having that mix of confidence and humility to surround myself with skilled people that uh, that can back me up in the areas that I'm not strong in. So I don't have that specific skill that I that I lean on, um, other than hard work, dedication, and commitment to results. Hmm. Yeah, I believe all those are quite important <laughs> to be yeah, successful. Um, another thing I always say that uh, helps in your journey is the people you surround yourself uh, with. So um, in terms of resources, has there been any, um, whether it be mentors, books, uh, anything that's helped you along your, your career path? When I went to University of Calgary, I leaned heavily on the career services there for, for their advice. Also, um, when I was starting to write, realizing how important it is to have good writing, uh, which, by the way, seemed to be a lost art in the workforce these days, I leaned heavily on what the University of Calgary called the Effective Writing Center, I, which, which was a free service. I took all my written work to them for, for critique and comment. And even as I was starting to get straight A's, I still kept coming back to them because there's always something you can learn. It's always good to have someone else provide input on, on your writing. And I think if you can express yourself well, 
written, um, you, you can achieve more success in life. So that's uh, probably the, the number one area that, that I sought out support from. Mm, that's awesome. Anybody that's uh, listening, seek out those uh, resources as well. Um, speaking about the environmental uh, services industry workforce, um, what's maybe a common misconception about the industry that you wish would uh, be debunked? Some of the things that we struggle with all the time is the, the difference between environmental profession and environmental activism. Um, when you say that you work in the environmental sector, many people think that, oh, you must be like Greta Thunberg and, oh, maybe I, you know, I, say that I recycle too. Uh, I'm very committed to this and that and Greenpeace is great. But the environmental profession is, is very different. It's a highly educated uh, sector of, of competent people that are basing their opinions on scientific findings and not so much on, on, on opinions and, and activism. So that's one thing that, we, that we're trying to debunk a little bit at Ikana showcasing to the world that there is a strong workforce here doing dedicated work or it is when we in the media to have a, re, a responsibility in that we we're talking about some of the big pipeline projects most of the environmental scientists involved are supportive of it they see the benefits of it but media typically finds the activists and the activist voice is very strong uh, the scientific voice is not quite that strong mm. and Earlier in the interview, you mentioned uh, finding success in the industry and also the skills that made you become successful. Um, I always like to ask, what does success mean to my guests? So my, my question would be to you, what does success look like, whether it be professionally or personally? I'm always inspired by achieving win-win-wins. So when you do any business, um, it's important to make sure that there's something in it for yourself. Are you benefiting from it? Are you, are, you, are you making money? Are you making a difference? And then also the same with uh, the people you do business with. You, any win-lose relationship is, is terrible and should be avoided at all costs because uh, um, it, it will end business. It's also motivating when the third win is there, which is you want to see that society benefits from what you're doing. So if we are successful, um, then we benefit from it. Our stakeholders benefit and society at large will have a more competent environmental workforce that we can rely on to solve some of the really complex issues that we're facing. Speaking of complex issues, uh, one thing about Calgary that I love is that it's such a innovative, entrepreneurial, um, lots of tech growth in the ecosystem here. Um, I love to get from your perspective, how has Calgary changed from when you first started uh, to now? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. If you, if you look at the history of Calgary, uh, it's it's a it's a history plagued with I should probably say the, the boom and the bust uh, yeah. and and it's it's strange to me I've only been here for about twenty years but it's strange to see that when things are hot people think it's never ever going down it's only going to continue to climb and then when things are not hot people think oh it's never going to rebound here we're, we're doomed forever and you go through these cycles much of that obviously is is connected to the fact that uh, the economy is so closely tied with with oil and gas. Um, now we're seeing a little bit more, you mentioned a couple of areas with, with tech, more tech companies are coming in. Uh, will that change? Will we now be able to diversify the economy more so we'll see more change? Um, some recent evidence suggests maybe the opposite right now. What we've seen and, and our organization has been affected by it. A lot of tech upstarts came in around the same time. They got a lot of funding. They spent a lot of that funding on inflating salary levels where they knocked on doors and they offered staff 100% salary increase of what they were making. And that drove salaries up at a time where we were rebounding from the pandemic and there was a lot of growth in, the, in all industries at the same time. So that kind of created another potential bubble. Will we see that one come down? Many of the tech companies that did get the funding were out of business in four or five months. They maybe spent that money a little bit too liberally. So I'm kind of curious to see, are they learning? Uh, is there some <laughs> tips and tools we can make so that the, the, the great tech boom that's coming into to this city can be a little bit more sustainably run? So it doesn't uh, just coach people. And then if you look at any resumes lately, it's not uncommon to have three jobs in the last one year, two of them being tech companies that for some reason went under. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like there's definitely 
some diversity happening in the ecosystem here, not just oil and gas, but it's, is it sustainable? That's, that's kind of what we're, we're looking for in, in the future here in Calgary. Mm-hmm. Uh, you spoke on boom and bust. Uh, one thing as a leader or even entrepreneur, you go through cycles of uh, wins and also I don't like to call them failures, but learning opportunities. But how do you build that resilience in times of, let's say, a downturn or some, some uh, softness in the market? Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's a downturn or, or not, ensuring you have resilience is important. And I think the key to achieve resilience is to really focus on the vision of the organization. What's the big picture? What, what are some of those high goals uh, or the reason for being for the organizations you work for? And, and if you're able to keep your eyes fixed to that prize and then motivate and, and, and drive your teams to also keep their eyes on the goal, uh, I think you're going to be able to withstand a lot of different challenges. And, and that's what we try to do here. And in the process of that, we try to always set aside at least once a month where we try to celebrate success, even in the hard times. What have we achieved? Because as, as any business leaders or people involved in business, you typically deal with problems and challenges, and, and then that can influence you. It's even more important when you go through those challenges to look at, hey, you know, we've come a long ways. We have achieved success. And it's important to highlight that and celebrate that with the team that's working hard to achieve it. Mm, absolutely. Speaking of highlighting achievements, do you want to highlight any achievements on the podcast for the listeners? Anything that's uh, happened recently in the organization? Yeah, I'm quite proud that uh, last year um, we were able to create 4,500 new environmental jobs, put people into those jobs and see them soar. That makes me very proud. I'm also proud of some of our indigenous training programs. We've now been able to do training directly in more than 270 indigenous communities in, in all jurisdictions across the, across the country, in all territories, provinces, we've been present and we're seeing some of those essential skills training programs lead to good results on the employment market, which benefit the individuals that have a job, benefits, you know, the, the social benefits. That there's now more of a trained workforce in rural and remote areas that they can tap into when they have projects there. It's a lot cheaper to hire people from the area you're going to be working than uh, flying people in and out that have that high expense. I love that you do that. You uh, hire people within the communities to help uh, build those communities. So that's very much appreciated. Um, what's One question I'd love to ask also on the podcast, my guess, is uh, what's maybe one question that you uh, never get asked that you wish you would be asked? Well, speaking and tying it back in with the environmental sector, um, I think it's it's important to see that this is a sector that uh, has a very small margin sometimes. Um, it, it still baffles me that companies and individuals will buy legal services from a lawyer and they'll never think about uh, nickeling and diming that lawyer. Uh, they just assume that a lawyer brings a wealth of, uh, of experience and, and, and we pay whatever it is. We don't, we don't negotiate a price. Eh? $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour. Okay, well, if that's what it is. And, oh, you said you were 10 hours. Okay, I, I better just pay this invoice. Why is it so different in the environmental sector when you buy the services from a highly competent environmental professional that may lower your risk and lower your exposure, um, help you make wise business decisions? Why is that worth little and, and, and why do you always or often do just the bare minimum in order to comply with the regulations as opposed to to use this as a, as a great value um that, that can save businesses a lot of money um not, not to mention the pr associated with it so so that's that's one of those things that i'm that we're trying to address we, we certify environmental professionals we try to elevate the credibility of the environmental workforce and, and bring that into the to the general public so that people know what it means to be an environmental professional and, and what they bring to the table. Mm. And I hope uh, this interview helps spread awareness and educates uh, about the, such a great uh, things you guys are doing. Um, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Um, we have a few more questions here for you, Kevin. Um, where can our listeners connect with you online? So we are present on all the major social media platforms. You can find us on LinkedIn, you can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, Twitter. We're also easily reached by our website. Go to eco.ca, subscribe to our newsletters, be part of the community. We do host events all the time. We have a lot of different webinars you can sign up for and be part of. So 
we're very e easy to find and eco.ca is the website you can go to to get in touch sweet i'll uh, put those links in the description guys so go reach out um again it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast kevin uh, since it's a leadership podcast, um, I have one last question for you, and that is, what does being a leader or leadership mean to you? Well, I think a leader is someone who can inspire um, stakeholders and the organization to pull in the same direction and to achieve results together. Uh, I think a leader is someone who is able to keep calm under pressure and be confident in their decisions and in the direction that they're leading the organization in. Um, I think a leader also needs to be competent and able to balance empathy, empathy with enforcement uh, in order to achieve business results. I think those are the, the main areas that I highlight as, uh, as important for a leader. Hello, I'm Kevin Nielsen, and uh, you're listening to Joe Momo Presents. Thanks again for watching the Joe Momo Presents podcast. For more episodes, check out joemomo.com slash podcasts. All right, see you next time.